build a relationship with another person, with an animal, or with a plant or a land, when we feel that we contributed to them thrive, I think it's a fantastic feeling. Welcome to the Crossing It Off podcast, where each episode we share the stories of individuals that are living out their bucket slash life goal list. I am your host, Roger Williams, and through hearing our guests' adventures, my goal is that you will find encouragement and empowerment to add and cross items off of your list. Welcome everybody to the show. Excited for this episode. You know, a lot of times your bucket list items um, can be trips and adventures, but a lot of times for folks, their bucket list items are personal and things that they want to accomplish and help out others and our planet. And that's what we have today in our guest, Grazinia Witkowska. She describes herself as a practicing kinesiologist, a hypnotherapist, and human-animal partnership coach, and she's passionate about co-creating a world where animals and are valued and respected. Grazinia, welcome to the show. <clears throat> Lovely to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. So, Grazinia, what is the item that you crossed off your list? Ah, my item, help my native grasses to thrive. Okay, awesome. So this is an environmental uh, bucket list item. And so explain to our listeners, what do you mean by native grasses? What would be the difference? I, I'm assuming that invasive species is, is the opposite of that. So what are native grasses and how do you uh, distinguish them? Because it all looks green to me. All right. Well, do we have whole day? <laughs> I start by saying that I live in Australia. Now, my name definitely is not typically Australian. I was born in Poland for the record. And I lived here for, well, now nearly 40 years. Mm. Uh, Australia has a very specific environment because we have very old soils. Those soils are... Uh, comparatively to soils of Europe or Northern America, um, much um, less rich in many minerals. Uh, the grasses of Australia have evolved with this environment and so do animals, etc. But the newcomers, uh, the Europeans who settled Australia uh, of recent times, the 200 plus years ago, uh, brought with them what they knew, meaning cattle, sheep, etc. Right. Now, uh, the native grasses were not exactly the best food source for those animals. Ah, okay. So often, uh, there were other species brought up. Uh, the, also, the uh, as I found out, uh, some people would fertilize the soils in order to help the new grasses grow better and provide the full, fuller nourishment to uh, animals like cows and sheep. Uh, I was uh, living in the area. It was very fortuitous because, you know, when I first started living in Australia, I needed to look after myself. I got a job um, uh, in IT and I had to work in big cities. Mm. But I always dreamt of country life. But to me, the country life was a bit like what I remember from my grandparents' farm in Poland, um, holidays and uh, spend, spending time with the land. I knew there was a lot of hard work involved, but I had minimum um, burden to do that. So for me, country was a fantastic place and I dreamt of living in the country. Well, one day, uh, I got a job in Adelaide. That's a smaller city than Sydney, where I used to right. live, about a million people. And I was able to have a piece of land, 25 acres, only mm. about 45 minutes door-to-door -door commute from work. Not bad, not bad. So I started my country adventure. And 
well, the things that drew me there were that it was not exactly self-sufficient, but there were a lot of um, that sort of self-sufficiency self-sufficiency hallmarks there i had to catch my own water there was uh, the rainfall for those who are interested was about 650 700 millimeters um per year that's not much so no. that was a, a drier kind of country and i was catching the rainwater in order to su sustain myself and the house garden so that was like really nice spending time with the land, but I always knew that I couldn't say this is my land as I possess it and I can use it for myself. Mm -hmm. It was more, I am a guardian for this land and it's a partnership, it's a relationship. Uh, what can I do for you? And then see what I can receive back but without expectation i'm a bit crazy like that so uh, i wanted to do something for the land the people who lived there just before me uh, planted a lot of trees that's as i found out it's not an easy job but it's relatively easy job because yeah. trees are a big thing you can see it well, the first thing I, when I got there, I just looked around. I talked to people in pubs, got to know about um, things that were, got, had, you know, that were being offered around, went to some meetings, met some people. Somehow I learned about an organization that um, it was a government local organization who was helping the farmers and the landowners to look after the land. And a man came over one afternoon, looked at the place, uh, seemed impressed with the variety of native grasses I had, and also even gave me a list of all different species of uh, plants that he saw on my property. And we talked a little bit about you know, restoring the land. I started to learn how important the understory is and how both the trees can help the grasses and the grasses are necessary to uh, protect the soils so the trees can survive so we don't lose the water etc so that was um that's how i started thinking about looking after the grasses now when uh, when i say the man was impressed with the variety of my native grasses that wasn't obviously a common place if he was impressed, because as I explained before, uh, people would have the, the sheep were the sure. animals uh, who, which were kept in this area because it was so dry. There was not enough grass to sustain a, a large animals like cattle. And so um, sheep would eat up pretty much everything. And also there could have been, the, the land could have been fertilized from the air. But fortunately no one fertilized that land and the land had sort of natural outcrops of rocks. Yeah. And uh, some people cleared the rocks, some people didn't. I was fortunate, I had plenty of rocks, so uh, it provided habitat to different animals but also protected the grasses because the sheep preferred to eat the grass where it was flat rather than um, try to eat between the rocks just mm -hmm. as well they didn't keep goats otherwise they wouldn't yeah. <laughs> um, so I uh, honestly speaking I was a bit slow starting because I didn't quite know which way so I took my time um, listening, thinking. Um, I like to say I got my intuition to go and fish for different solutions. And then once presented to my logical thinking, the logical thinking could justify what I wanted to do and why. Well, um, eventually I concluded that I would uh, map out what I had, where I would put my greatest effort. Ah, very important thing. I went to this um, workshop about native grasses and looking after native grasses. There was a, a man nearby, his name's Andrew. 
uh, he is not only a grass enthusiast, but also a botanist. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I went to this workshop and in this workshop, he showed us a um, big open paddock of uh, wallaby grass. To me, it was just something incredible because I haven't seen such a big open spaces with native grasses. And I could just imagine what, what this area could have looked like mm. before the settlement of white people. Is there any benefit to reclaiming those grasses besides that it's just a native species or is there, I mean, because it was brought in for the animals, that's no longer a need that you have on your property. So what was the, what was the need for making sure that the native grasses were healthy and, and thriving and coming back into existence? Well, that's a very, very important consideration. And I try to be fair answering it. My first uh, instinct or my first inkling was to help the land to be the best it can be. And to me, it was about being, you know, like authentically, it was what mm. it was before it got spoiled. So let's reclaim that naturalness, that, that core of what the land is about. Now, having said that, and I still believe that this is so, uh, but, you know, killing other species is... I don't know, do I love grasses? So why do I kill some and not the others? Uh, it's probably a bit more uh, palpable when we start talking about animals. Uh, one of the things in Australia that were, that were introduced, they were rabbits. So in Australia, uh, there were also at one stage rabbits introduced and foxes for hunting. Mm -hmm. And now rabbits are a big plague and foxes are a big plague. And I love animals. And I argue why, you know, that's no fault of their own. Right. That they were here. And now they are made into the, you know, the worst of the worst. And they have to be killed. I saw a fox being hanged over a fence, a dead fox. Mm. Obviously, someone was gloating how they killed a fox. And that didn't make me feel good. Because you know, we, people don't take responsibility for doing what they did. They just blame the fox. Yeah, we have that problem in the States, especially with dogs. Um, in certain cities in the South, they they just let dogs kind of roam and wander. And then um, especially pit bulls are seen as this vicious breed and they, you know, they, they're, I forget what the statistic was, but it was really high percentage are immediately killed when they get to shelters because of the, of the mindset around them. And it's really kind of sad. I don't know whether it was the ultimately the right decision to restore those grasses or Am I just kidding myself? I thought it was worthwhile preserving them. Perhaps if there was a different guardian of the land, they would have made a different decision. Mm -hmm. So what So what does that look like as far as preserving them? I got in my head, you're sitting down on your lawn with a pair of tweezers mm -hmm. pulling out the invasive, you know, the non-localized blades of grass. What does that look like? What is that process like for you to try to... to get rid of one, one species and, and help the native grasses thrive? Well, it can be very tedious or it can be less tedious. I um, think I'm a lazy bugger, <laughs> so I would prefer to make it easy for myself. Now, going back to that workshop um, about grasses, uh, the man has in explained to us how he achieved that sort of... Um, big spaces of native grasses. And mind you, I come back to that, that they were the same species of grass and they don't have to be the same to be natural. Um, 
Uh, so coming back to that, that when the man explained, he said, because he knew what the native grasses looked like mm. precisely, he covered the native grasses, say with bucket, and he sprayed with glyphosate everything else. And then he did that another year. And after two years, he employed people to help him weed the mm. non-native grasses. And they had to be really cluey people because when they little, you have to, you know. Right, get the root probably. Them. Yeah. Uh, well, when I learned that, how, however much I wanted to have native grasses on my property, more native grasses on my property, I really didn't want to do mm. that hard work. And I didn't want to use glyphosate. I, I tried to minimize the use of chemicals. I don't know about America, but I know lately there was a big thing about glyphosate being so toxic that it's disallowed in some countries. Well, it's still allowed in Australia. I start thinking, how can I do it easier? And by chance, I came across an American man, then Daggett, D-A-G-G-E-T. Uh, he wrote a book, Gardeners of Eden. Mm. And there he explained his approach to restoring the land. One of the examples he gave was a, like a ex-mine that was supposed to be rehabilitated and rehabilitated and never quite got rehabilitated. What he did, he brought some hay, he brought some cattle, he got them grazed there, poop there, trample the stuff in and provide the environment where the plants were happy to start growing and therefore recolonize that area. So I thought, of course, why not collaborate with an environment? If right. I were to provide the right conditions for the environment to rebuild itself, that would be fantastic. I would do only a portion of work. And at that time, I was not a kinesiologist yet. I was working in the city. But um, now, in retrospect, this is exactly what we do in kinesiology. We find out where the energetic paths are. For those listeners who don't know what kinesiology is, it's um, uh, energy medicine based on traditional Chinese way mm -hmm. of approaching things, where Chinese believe everything is energy and energy moves through meridians. Now they mapped the meridians to the organs and later on osteopaths and um, chiropractors, they mapped the muscles to the meridians. So now with using kinesiology, we can probe the muscle and determine which meridians are out of balance. And then readjusting the meridians, rebalancing the meridians that need rebalancing, we put the, the body in a state that it can heal itself more easily. So that's exactly what I wanted to do with the land, do something that would help the land to heal itself. That's, I thought that was pretty cool. But how <laughs> do I do that? <laughs> and, um, and of course, I was picking on the ideas that I read in the book, in then um, Dagger's book. But I couldn't use cattle because they were hard hoofed animals. Uh, I don't know what I mentioned that because they did not evolve on the land. They were soft footed animals like kangaroos, emus, right? But right. hard animals, they compacted the soil. So sure. they were doing something the soils were not used to. So I couldn't really use them. Uh, so I needed to do something different. So one of the common things that I have learned people do, they remove hard hoofed animals from the land that they want to restore. I didn't have any sheep, but I allowed my neighbors to bring their sheep. Uh, you know, when they just wanted a little a supplementary feeding or in the winter because I had more trees than they had. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had more shelter. It sort of started like that. 
Now, because I knew that the best parts were among the rocks and there were few, like maybe there was a small area where there was particularly rocky, I decided that this area will be my islands of excellence. So I will focus on looking after this area and hope that the native grasses will start spreading from there. Mind you, I had 25 acres to look after, so I wasn't sort of counting on this to be happening overnight. But I decided to be patient, just do what I need to do and wait for you know, the results to unfold themselves. How because long does that take? How long did it take for you to um, watch those grasses rehabilitate and, and um, get stronger? I think it was about four years when it suddenly became obvious that mm. the whole place had changed. And, okay, I'll, uh, I'll skip to the end for a moment. I'll come back later to how it was done. But about four years later, uh, this friend now and the ex-teacher, Andrew, came to my property because I wanted him to identify particular grass that I found. Uh, the, the, the bunch I found was near the dam. I had books, but, you know, if you get sure. a real person, they, they have experience that one cannot quite glean from the book. Um, and we just walked through the property and he was, he used to come maybe a couple of times a year to have a look what I'm doing. But um, he was noticeably thrilled with the change. And at one stage, he was walking and stopped and said with an admiration as for uh, um, the grass enthusiast would admire only the, the particular grass. He says, oh, you have red leg grass. Where did you get it from? <laughs> and that's when I understood that the place have changed. And I think my way worked better than his way. Uh, I told him gently about that. And he said that his rainfall in his area was different uh -huh. to mine. And therefore, he had to take a different approach that my approach would have not worked in his way. But, but um, I'll just jump to it because... I didn't use the spraying stuff. Right, the chemicals and things. Yeah, I think it was maybe the, a chance that if I missed that red leg grass, because it was like minuscule, like, you know, there was hardly any of it at the time. And if I missed it, then I would spray it and kill it. Mm -hmm. But because I didn't spray and I gently removed the grasses that I didn't want, I never hurt the native grasses, even if I didn't know they were there. So my big question is, is that how did going through this whole process, it's, it's a lengthy multi-year process. How did that affect you and how you saw your land when you saw that the rehabilitation was setting in and working. I had a great satisfaction. I had a great satisfaction at the point of having done, you know, like one square meter of clearing the invasive grasses in order to allow the natives to have space, the window of opportunity to spread, put their seeds on, grow into it. Uh, but every time I made a trip, I rejoice being with the land i got to know it i got to know about the grasses i got to know about people who think about grasses i got to play with ideas for example i i noticed that one particular grass from south africa called pentashista when it's young before it flowers it's got a very distinct smell yeah. and i started um playing with an idea that oh, maybe we could train dogs to sniff those out. Wow. And however crazy that seemed, later on, hold, uh, lo and behold, I'm watching television and finding out that 
they've been using uh, dogs to sniff out particular animals by sniffing their droppings. Right. So they could determine whether these animals were in that, you know, rare animals in that vicinity. And so being with, uh, you know, being in that environment relating to the place was very rewarding. And knowing that I've done something for someone else uh, was very rewarding. Be it a relationship with another person, with an animal, or with a plant or a land, when we feel that we contributed to them thrive, I think it's a fantastic feeling. What's and, a, what's one thing that if you could, if you, somebody else was like, I want to start doing this, What's like the one thing that you would say, hey, if you're going to start doing this real quick, what was what would that one thing that you would you would encourage them to do? Do it. <laughs> if you offer a piece of advice, because knowing it's going to take okay. multiple okay. years. What's remember, one thing? remember that if you have that thing inside your heart that you want to do it, just do it. Uh, know that you will find a way and know that you will find support to have it done. So just just do, however little it seems you can do at the beginning, once you do this little, the new horizons will open for sure. Awesome. Gerzinha, thank you so much for being here. I know this is a short amount of time. How can people find you on the internet uh, or someplace if they have questions or want to learn more about what you do and what you've done, where can they find you? Uh, well, they can find me on bestversionsofus.com, versions plural. And they can see my new book, uh, uncommonfriends.net is the link to it. It's about chickens and creating relationship with chickens. Nice. Uh, and um, yes, I think there is. A, I, I am on the Instagram, but it's something best versions of us, I think. I will find those and put those in our show notes so that folks that are listening wanting more information can go to those directly. If anyone's interested in how to approach the restoration of the land uh, using that sort of method of, you know, let's build a relationship and let's see how we can help each other to get the result. I'll be more than happy to have more conversations. With awesome. You. Thank you for that. That's great that you open yourself up like that. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. I know you have tons of information and that's probably because crossing the side and off took uh, several years, um, but I definitely uh, appreciate you being here and showing our, and explaining to our listeners that bucket list items don't necessarily always have to be about taking trips, but it can be about helping the environment and doing other things. So thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. As a reminder to our listeners, in this episode's show notes, you will find links to learn more about this week's guests and information on how you can cross this item off of your list. You can follow my adventures of crossing items off my bucket list on Instagram and Facebook. And as always, new episodes of this podcast are available to stream every Friday morning. We will meet you here next week. And until then, keep living out your lists.